Hi. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Paul Keller. I am co-director of an Amsterdam-based think tank that works on digital policy issues. And um, we're focusing generally on openness in the digital domain. And so I'm here to talk, to give a policy presentation at a developers conference. I saw the person before me showing GitHub slides or GitHub screenshots and like, I hope um, I'll have something to offer you to you as the audience. Um, I want to thank Blender um, for the opportunity to speak here. And um, I'm going to speak about AI and generative AI and the relationship with copyright and creativity, which is a topic which is increasingly dominating much of the discussions we as Open Future have had over probably the past one and a half years, but really that this has become also a policy issue the past year since the beginning of this year. And um, the talk I'm going to give is based on a blog post which I wrote in June um, of this year, had the same title as the talk. And after I published that, Ton had approached me and said, like, maybe this is a good idea to submit this as a talk for the Blender conference. And so here I am, and here I'm going to talk. Um, I'm actually, while I work on policy, like I have a bit of a history with Blender. Um, I know Blender since around 2006, 2007, when I worked at an organization called Kennisland at the time, which uh, ran a small funding scheme called the Digital Pioneers. And we funded a number, or co-funded a number of the Blender open movies that were released here. You see here the um, a photo from the premiere of Big Buck Bunny in uh, 2008. Um, and so I have sort of known the Blender sort of model, the community, the way the foundation works for quite, quite a while now and also in subsequent jobs, um, followed the work of Blender and the community. And um, uh, mainly from an interest, as also the name of our organization, our current organization suggests, from openness, right? Like, and for us, um, at that time, like my main sort of focus on all of this was Creative Commons, and Blender was one of the examples that really ran with the idea of combining openness across the software stack, the way the uh, movies were produced, the way content was used and shared. And for us, that has the Blender community, the Blender foundation, the sort of, you have always been like an enormous inspiration in showing sort of like how you can leverage the concept of openness on the number of levels. And it's been very inspiring to see Blender as an organization, as a community, the software grow into where it is today. Um, and so um, that is why we always had a keen interest in sort of Blender and seeing how communities produce goods that are available in the open and how we can preserve these kind of characteristics. And now, 15 years later, 15 years after 2008, um, we find ourselves in a situation where there's some fairly significant technological developments, maybe not directly related to animation software or 3D rendering software, but generally to content production have sort of come over us, as it feels for many people who haven't really been involved in the technology very suddenly um, since about last summer, right? Like, and this is, develop this is dominating a lot of the discussions about creative production, about the role of creators, the balance between human creators and machine creators, the role of the commons, the future of the internet, a lot of things that we care about. Um, and so um, we see it as our role at Open Future to also go into these discussions and try to understand to some degree uh, both where the policy is going, trying to influence the policy, but also understand community norms and preferences in this entire space. And so it is very interesting for me to talk to you here about this today. And in the reminder of this talk, I want to share some of our thinking that we have developed around these issues over the last sort of roughly 12 months or something. Um, and maybe hear a little bit back from you, although the format isn't really geared towards that like how you look at this. So this is also an invitation maybe to come to me afterwards and tell me what you think. Um, 
generally, like the emergence of this generative AI systems over the last 15 months or so has sort of resulted in a number of fairly strong um, positions from creators, from people involved in the creative industries, from rights holder organizations, also from commercial rights holders, from people in this space, and roughly it falls into um, as in, into two different camps. The one camp you see like a quote from an open letter that was uh, um, sent in uh, earlier this year here. The, the, as people understood how this technology works, and sort of not in detail, but that a big part of this technology is that it requires enormous amounts of training data or copyrighted works as training data in the case of large language models or um, image generators, that it requires these, and these are generally scraped up from the internet. People have started, like the one camp has very clearly identified this as like in terms of theft and copyright infringement, and you see the, I guess, I guess you get the gist from this quote here on the other side. Um, on the other side, we also have seen probably a much smaller contingent, but generally also creators who work more, maybe more technology forward, who work more with technology, who've come out in support of this technology and say, like, this is something that we need to incorporate into our artistic practices. This empowers us to do things that we couldn't do before. And who are generally concerned that issues about locking this technology down through means of copyright and through means of maybe other regulation is in the end detrimental to creation and creators. So we have these, these, these two camps uh, that, that are in this discussion. Like I think the first one, the first camp is clearly more dominant in public discourse, but like the other position is there as well. And I was interested, like maybe like a little bit of a show of hands, who of you would like identify rather with that first position? So the sort of AI is theft. Can you raise your hands? Okay, and by comparison, the other camp, like the sort of this is a technological opportunity that we should embrace camp. Well, a little bit more in this room, like uh, which, which maybe isn't surprising because I said like people who, like we generally see this coming from people working in the arts with technology and like I don't know you, but like I would assume that this sort of describes many of you. Um, so the question that we need to answer for ourselves as a society, as a artists, as policy makers is how should we deal with the fact that machines can now consume all of human creativity, reassemble it and spit out synthetic content that sort of resembles that human creativity um, that was previously produced or the exclusive, like only humans were able to produce that. And uh, I don't think it's productive and like, I don't think many people think it's productive to think, to question this, right? Like this is a technological reality. This is technology which in all likelihood will improve over the next couple of things. Like I think there's also reasonable doubts that maybe it will run into a wall at some point and not necessarily become general artificial intelligence as once some people hope and other people fear. But that this technologically it's possible to reassemble creativity at this large scale and spit it out is like a given that we will need to deal with. And at the same time, like and I guess that's at the heart of the discussion, many of the observers in this um, feel that this is a situation that copyright should be able to somehow solve, right? Like generally we have problems in the creative sector, people always look at copyright as the first solution. Now we would argue, and I don't want to bore you with the details so much, but like that copyright is entirely unfit to solve this issue, right? Like this starts with very simple things that for example copyright generally attaches to the concept of copying and making something available. And those of you who know how these generative AI models get trained will know you basically make a copy once very early in the process, then the model learns from this copy, and there's no more copying going on. The work isn't necessarily in there. There's abstract concepts of that work embedded in that model, but it is every time it spits out something, there's not copying going on. So like by the traditional concepts of copying, and it's also not making available the original work. So by the traditional concepts and sort of mechanical hooks of copyright, this copyright just doesn't apply at some stage after a model has been trained. And a model can be trained, can have been trained in the past and like will be used for many, many years going forward. Um, 
another problem, obviously, is like copying copyright somehow sort of assumes a direct relationship between the original work and then the output. But we're having here, like in the space of um, image generators, for example, we have uh, models that are trained on multiple billions of works that are all feeding in there, that are all of the same importance to this model, and that will not be sort of like, it is extremely difficult to trace output of these things, where you might have the feeling that this should somehow be regulated, to actually any of these works in there. And generally, you might argue, maybe some of the more well-known works have more of an influence, but we also know from the literature, like, removing individual works from the training data doesn't really have an effect on any of the output. So, like, it is not about copying this thing going on. And then, obviously, also, if there is billions of works in there, like, how do you copyright usually um, assume some way of revenue flow based on copyright back to the original creators? Like, how do you, dis like, something that a model that is trained on five billion works, how do you identify revenue flows to individual artists back? So this is, copyright is really running into some of its conceptual boundaries with the way this technology works. Sometimes you could even think, like, this technology is, like, a little bit designed almost to, to, to elegantly run around copyright. But there's another effect, and... I come back uh, to Naomi Klein, and uh, this is an article she wrote. She says, and I think that's also right, what we are witnessing is that the wealthiest companies in history unilaterally seizing the sum total of human knowledge that exists in digital scrappable form and walking off uh, inside, like putting it inside proprietary models that they then exploit. So there is also a problem that we have created this sum total of human knowledge, or some people might call this the digital commons, or just the public internet, and suddenly these companies come in and scrape everything up, put it into their proprietary models, and try to benefit from that. Like, the business models aren't very well evolved at that moment, but we can be pretty sure that this will be, uh, in some form, a lucrative business, which raises the question also, how can we sustain um, or ensure the sustainability of the digital commons as a whole. And those of you who follow maybe sort of a bit tech news will have um, noticed things like Reddit closing down, right? Like that was a direct reaction that Reddit realized we don't want these machine crawlers come in that feed the AI models, take all of the thing. The, the fact that things like um, Stack Overflow have declined enormously is a similar thing. Um, you could argue that sort of like some of the decisions in the demise of Twitter with closing it for unregistered users, for example, also been an answer against AI crawlers or something. So we see these resources that were the public internet that were some shared common good, often privately owned, but available to the general public, free to do more or less whatever you wanted to do with them are suddenly closing down. And so how can we ensure the sustainability of these commons resources is one of the questions that we are asking ourselves. And so we've come up with broadly two lines of argument of inquiry where we say like, okay, this is what needs to happen. So on the one side, we think um, there needs to be the ability for creators to control how of their works and also their artistic identity, their style, things that are traditionally not protected by copyright, because copyright applies only to the expression, are being used by commercial AI systems, right? Like, give them some control, and interestingly, for example, in EU copyright law, well, there are rules that allow this opt-out for commercial AI training, but that still enable, for example, for scientific research, like, they, they mean scientific research is free. So on the one hand, said you need to give creators some kind of agency. Creators need to be able to say, no, I don't want to be part of this, or no, I don't want to be part of this for a while while I develop my own stuff, or maybe later. There's lots of different reasons. And on the other hand, we need mechanisms to ensure that a portion of the surplus from training AI on humanity's collective creativity flows back to the commons. Um, this is not training AI only on commercially produced or on works produced by professional artists that you can then give, like identify the professional artists via collecting societies or something and give money back to only these artists. This is also stuff on Wikipedia. This is everything all of us write in fora on, on the internet. This is probably a lot of the output from 
the Blender community that is shared online, that stuff is being trained on, without these people having a sort of like representation as professional artist where you would have some mechanism that you can give back to artists. You hear the professional artists say this, this should be licensed and like we need to get money out of this, but this is broader than just the use of professional creativity by people who are members of collecting societies. And so in the last five minutes, um, I want to walk you through like a little bit more elaborate um, sort of uh, version of these two general principles. And this is something that we've started to develop with um, communities on a global level. We had this at a Creative Commons Summit like a couple of weeks ago where we came up with these principles and we were testing this with various communities to see like how this works and how they feel about it. And um, we've come up with seven of these principles. So the first one is that we need to ensure that people have the, whatever we do, right? Like as a prerequisite, like also if there's harm being done to maybe creators in the comments, we need to also ensure that people have the ability to study and analyze existing works in order to create new works, either by themselves or through machines. This is how humans learn, right? Like this is how probably all of you have learned to use, use software, build software, create, etc. And this is like a fundamental principle that has always been outside of the scope of, for example, copyright. Like you have a book, you can do whatever you want with it. You can like read it and ignore it. You can put it on your shelf, but you learn from it. And that is not governed by any law, what you can do with a book, what you can do with knowledge that you have access to. Um, the second principle is to ensure that all copyrighted works can be used for training for public interest and non-commercial AI systems, right? Like we see that we, we can't, we, we're afraid here that we're creating a situation where we make this dependent on licensing payments or anything for every type of use that this benefits those large corporations who have the resources to license everything, who maybe also license on exclusive basis everything and to build themselves like a massive data advantage over everybody else. And so research and non-commercial uses need to be freely possible for everyone. And we're really thinking like the problem is here or, or, or the problem that we need to address at least is one of the commercial uses of these systems, right? Um, so that's the second principle. The third principle is that we need to ensure that creators have the right to opt out from the use of their work for training commercial AI systems. This is essentially like the, the one I mentioned earlier. So we think legal systems need to give creators the right to say no to this. Um, but in this limited context for commercial applications of this, you shouldn't be able to say no for people experimenting. You shouldn't do this for scientific research. This is because the technology is not only used to create sort of for large language models or for, for things, it's also in scientific research, in medical sciences, in a lot of scientific sort of method also builds increasingly on the training of AI systems and we don't want to cut this off. Um, this is again something which, for example, in the current EU legal framework, there's a nice difference between using copyright work for scientific research and on the other hand, for training all types of other systems. Then the fourth principle is a bit one, like this is a global conversation, but there is concerns among people in the global south and the majority world that types of traditional knowledge that is community-based knowledge, which isn't necessarily well framed in terms of copyright, something that this needs to be protected from people coming out and training machines on traditional knowledge resources that are not. There's this idea that often these types of knowledge are stewarded by, by, um, by communities uh, in some form or there's specific community stewards and we think this needs additional protection as well. And then the fifth principle is um, that everybody, so not only creators, but like this is probably most relevant also again for creators, that everybody has the right to exclude personal data like their likelihood their identity, their artistic style from being mimicked, from being trained on in these systems, right? Like the, the way an actor acts, the way a singer sings, like these things are not necessarily things that are copied, but that, that are protected by the, our notions of copyright at the moment. But with these sort of systems that can mimic human creativity, they become things that suddenly become transferable. And this should be something that needs to 
people need to have the ability to say, like, we don't want this. It's also obviously clear for personal data that personal data shouldn't just be thrown into their systems, right? And then six, um, we also need to ensure that the economic benefits of training AI systems on publicly available data are shared back with the commons. This is the other one I had at the top. So we really think we need to think about some form of levy or compensation system that applies to commercial systems that train on broadly available open data and that gives that back to the commons. Now, it's very difficult to imagine like how you give something back to the abstract commons, the open internet, like a community, because they obviously don't necessarily have a bank account or something. So we tie this a little bit to our um, seventh and final principle, which is that we also need to invest in public compute infrastructure and public data sets that are governed as commons. So for a lot of the smaller, for a lot of the universities, for a lot of the smaller companies, for a lot of individuals experimenting with this, like these are real bottlenecks, right? Like access to capable compute and access to well-structured data sets that are cleared um, from opt-outs and maybe from personal data or something. And we see, uh, to some degree, a role for the public sector, for public money to step in here and build some of these infrastructures so we are not becoming increasingly dependent on a few big tech companies who can afford to build proprietary compute infrastructures, who can afford to build proprietary data sets that they use for themselves. We think this is a fairly fundamental technology and there needs to be like access to the resources to work with this, to, um, to build on top of this, that needs to be guaranteed as public digital infrastructure, if you will. And you can tie this to the last principle, so maybe a, a tax or a levy on commercial systems that are trained on, on public, public data could actually fund some of these investments. So this is sort of where we are at the moment with answering some of these things. Again, um, I'd be curious to hear what you think about this after the talk. Um, but for now, that's it. So thank you.